My name is Janelle Linton and I am the research project manager for the community engagement team and will be acting as your MC for the evening. So the purpose of the Learning Hub is to provide a community learning forum for all across the Recover initiative. The Learning Hubs are forums for exchanging ideas, information, and resources related to recover and long COVID with patient caregivers and community representatives, local hub sites, and the overall Recover Consortium. Tonight, we will focus on plain language and design, which addresses one of the one of Recover's core principles, accessibility. Before we get into that, I would like to introduce our moderator for the night, Dr. Shauna Yin. Dr. Shauna Yin is a general pediatrician and associate professor of pediatrics and population health at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. She is an NIH funded researcher who is over 15 years, who spent over 15 years developing, implementing and evaluating health literacy informed in interventions with a focus on reducing health disparities. These interventions have been associated with improved health outcomes, including reduced medication errors, fewer preventable hospital adverse events, as well as improved child weight trajectories as part of early childhood child obesity prevention efforts. And she is nationally recognized for this work. Please welcome Dr. Shauna Yin. Hi, everyone. As the health literacy faculty lead for Recover, I'm really excited to be the moderator uh, for this session today. Um, before I move on to talk about um, the Learning Hub guidelines, um, I'd love to share with you a little bit about my personal story of how I began to do work um, addressing um, the issue of health literacy. Um, as Danelle said, um, I've been working in the field of health literacy for over 15 years. And when I first started, the term health literacy was just starting to be something that people knew about and were trying to address. And what, what really spurred me to begin to work in this field was seeing how often there was miscommunication between healthcare providers and families and how this led to poor outcomes. I saw this frequently um, during my time as a pediatrics resident at Bellevue Hospital in New York City, which some of you may know is one of the oldest public hospitals in the country. And it was the stories like these that led me to work in this area. The Mexican mom of a seven month old who returned to the emergency room for the third time in a month because of her child's febrile seizures and we eventually found out that the mother had been giving a drop instead of a dropper full of fever medicine. No one had communicated clearly to her how to give that medicine. The Tibetan father who didn't realize that he needed to keep antibiotics, um, to keep giving the antibiotics for a full course to treat a urine infection for a six month old. He wanted to save that precious medicine for later. And then the child ended up being admitted to the hospital with a kidney infection and for IV antibiotics. So stories like these that made me think to myself, we can do better and inspired me um, to become a researcher focused on designing, implementing, and evaluating health literacy-informed interventions. As a researcher, I strive to gather the evidence to support um, changes in clinical practice and in policy, and I really think about health literacy as a health equity issue and strongly believe in the importance of using health literacy-informed strategies as a way to address health disparities. Um, it's been really exciting that Recover has made a real commitment to infusing health literacy across the initiative, touching every aspect of the work being done from the approach to recruitment, um, to uh, getting consent um, for participating in the study, to developing survey questions and instructions for participants on how to obtain blood and saliva samples at home, to thinking about how information about Recover and its study findings are shared with the public. So we're really excited um, to have this session today to talk about um, why we've tried to weave health literacy into the fabric of Recover and how we've sought to do it with two key partners, Health Literacy Media and Tonic Group. So um, just, uh, this is the agenda. Um, Janelle just did our welcome. I'm going to go over some Learning Hub guidelines and do some introductions, and then we'll have the presentation followed by a Q&A session and some closing remarks. So I'm going to now introduce our two speakers. Um, we have Katina O'Leary. Uh, she's President and uh, Chief Executive Officer at Health Literacy Media, which is also called HLM. HLM is a health literacy-focused nonprofit that's based in St. Louis and whose work spans the world. Before joining HLM in 2012, Katina was an assistant professor, of Washington, um, professor at Washington University School of Medicine, where she led large-scale community-engaged research studies at sites across the U.S. and the world. Katina is a member of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine's Roundtable on Health Literacy, and is an executive board member for the International Health Literacy Association. Next, we have Layla Burr, who is the co-founder and managing director of Tonic Group, a creative design studio based in New York City. 
And for the past 10 years, Tonic Group has provided health literacy design solutions for large academic medical centers, including NYU, where Tonic Group's childhood obesity prevention work with an NYU-based research team was honored with a 2021 Innovation by Design Award in the social good category by Fast Company, a well, well-known technology and design publication. Tina and Layla, please go ahead and share your presentation. Well, thank you so much. We're excited to have a conversation with you today about health literacy. And we wanna start just with the framework. We wanna set the groundwork together about what is health literacy. Um, Shauna gave an excellent example of her experiences with health literacy that led to her work. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more just about setting the stage. Um, so there are lots of definitions. We, we wrote a paper a few years ago when we, we counted about 120 definitions, um, many, many definitions. Um, but some of the key factors really have to do with this differentiation between personal health literacy and organizational health literacy. Um, so we like to use these definitions from the Healthy People 2030 um, recent reports. They focus on personal health literacy, which is about how people, individuals, um, can find, understand, and use information and services to make their own health-related decisions and take action for themselves or their family. Um, so this is what we have in us and how we use that to determine our own medical care. The other definition focuses on organizations, and this is really important. Um, people can only make a series of definitions as long as the organizations and the environments around them are set up to structure their decisions and, and allow them to, frankly. Um, so if organizations are health literate, they are set up to equitable, equitably enable people to find, use, and understand information and services. So if organizations do this well, it sets up people to have um, a situation where they can make and implement choices for their own family and their health care. So these two things go together and they're really important as a pair of terms. Um, and this all sits in the concept of social determinants of health. So people talk about this as a sort of a broad term, but it thinks about all the things that sort of play into how we get and use information and make decisions about our health care. Um, so health literacy is one of these components and it's part of how we get and use health care and the quality of that health care. That's health literacy. But there are other factors that are important here too. So we have to think about people's financial resources, their economic stability. Um, we have to think about access to education. Um, very specifically, um, much of our healthcare information is written information. If you're not a strong reader, if you're not comfortable with your skills in literacy, it can be really hard to understand and use information. Um, that's all connected to your access to education and the quality of education that you received over your lifetime. So these things are, are related. Um, where you live and the resources in your neighborhood are also connected and in the social and community context. So we know that depending on what other people around you do, um, you may make choices about what seems um, normal or appropriate. Um, so all of these things um, impact your health literacy, um, but it's also associated with where people get their information. So one important thing to remember, particularly at this time in history where we're looking at so much misinformation, is just the reality that people with lower health literacy are more likely to get information from less viable um, and, and trusted sources. So they're more likely to get health information from social media or um, entertainment news rather than their doctors and medical centers. So we have to think about where information is coming from and how people process and absorb it because it impacts their choices. Um, so this, this slide talks about this cycle of misinformation. So health literacy influences the level of information they understand, but also where they get it. So um, there's some data that says that people who have lower health literacy are less likely to use quality sources. They instead use social media, TV, things like that, um, because they may not have the ability to find, understand, and use some other health services. Um, so their social media um, memes, what they see on Facebook, um, are more understandable and more accessible, more relatable. We know that health education materials are written beyond most people's ability to understand. So our job here is to take information from healthcare systems and try to write them at an easier level that's more understandable, more accessible to everybody. Um, all of these things matter, though, because they, they lead to health disparities and they cause barriers in systems um, to get worse, wider, wider system barriers that lead to more hospitalization and higher mortality rates. Um, so if we can manage information and make it more accessible to people, we can control um, and, and impact these um, very specific outcomes that are important. Um, so when we think about health literacy and research studies, we need to think about all the opportunities to provide information. And you heard Shauna say a little bit about this earlier and what a priority it is for Recover. Um, but very specifically, we want to use health literacy and clear communication through the whole study process. So we think about it in recruitment. We want materials that engage everyone. 
but also that encourage diverse representation. So we have to think about how people see themselves and know that this is for them too. Um, so this will show up in images and things like that that you'll hear Layla talk about a little bit later. Um, so examples here have to do with social media, how we design websites, the news releases, tip sheets, all of these pieces of information signal to people, this is for you, come on in and join us. When we think about consent, um, we need to think about understandable consent um, in a process that really is essential to true legal consent. So it's one thing to sign the form, it's another thing to understand what it is that we need you to do, what it is the commitment is, um, what your commitment involves. Um, so sometimes people who drop out of studies, we find they drop out because they didn't actually understand what they were gonna do um, from the beginning. So if we can set up that discussion that's very clear um, and very um, comprehensive in the beginning, we have a better situation. So the ICF templates, the assent forms, everything that we do in the consent area needs to be true consent. And um, we think about retention. Um, so collecting forms um, so that we're able to get information and that we keep people in the study. Um, they don't drop out because they don't understand what they're supposed to fill out, um, how they keep showing up. So any patient information that we can use for locator information is important, but also all the other forms of data collection forms. And this connects to what they do when they're with you, but also when you send them things and they need to return them. Um, we're spending a lot of time thinking about the results that go out. So as we get information, one of the keys to retention and keeping people engaged is, is making sure that they know what happened and how important their participation is to the overall study. So how do we provide patient-friendly summaries to help people understand their role, um, to keep them going, to keep them excited because they're part of something that's meaningful? Um, so examples are the trial summaries, um, any summaries of journal articles we can provide, what do we put on the web, what do we do on social media, um, how do we let people know that the data actually goes somewhere and we do something with it and we report back just not just to ourselves, but to them too. Um, we're all part of this, this process together. Um, we're evaluating insights all along the way, so thinking about focus groups and interviews and surveys, making reports, talking to all of our committees, but really getting feedback at every part of the process so that we know that everything that we do is grounded in values that we share together. Um, and then we have communication across the spectrum, so thinking about how we communicate to ourselves um, and how we communicate out to the community as well. So newsletters, blogs, web content. Um, these are just examples of the kinds of formats that are helpful, but for every single one of these um, parts of the process, we have to figure out how to how to sort of signal to people that this is for you um, and this is real and it's authentic and it's meaningful. Um, and there are ways to do this using health literacy tools. Um, so sometimes when we talk about health literacy, particularly in a science context, um, people get really um, sort of worried and they think about how does health literacy um, deal with the fact that there are all these regulatory requirements and guidelines that we also have to follow? Um, does health literacy map onto that or is it um, making information so simple that it's not accurate anymore. Um, so I like to show this slide that really just shows you how we think about health literacy principles um, alongside the requirements and guidelines that we all have to follow from the various entities. So when we talk about plain, clear language, um, we mean language that's plain and clear, but that also represents accurate, factual, and objective information. So those things map onto each other, and they're really important that we don't lose um, any component as we continue to communicate information. We talk about numeracy, how people understand numbers. Um, this is really important in the scientific process when we talk about um, doses of medicine, when we talk about how often they're going to take a medicine. Um, when we talk about the results from the study, we need to make sure that um, people understand those numbers, for example. Um, but it also maps onto balanced risk information. Um, so we, it's really important from a regulatory perspective that people understand the risks and the benefits. Um, and this often connects to numeracy as well. Um, we think about structure. Um, so for us, when we think about structure here, we want to make sure that information is understandable and there's a navigation process that people can follow throughout any material or any communication. Um, it's structured in such a way that it's meaningful and, and, and makes sense to them. And finally, in most of our health literacy materials, um, we'd like to have a behavior focus. We want people to understand what it is that we're asking them to do so they can agree to that specific action step. And this goes along with the regulatory requirements that information is actionable and applicable to people. Um, so these map on almost exactly. It's a slightly different use of, of terms, um, but the point is using plain, clear language that meets all the regulatory guidelines. Um, and so we also want to think just for a minute about why this is also important. So we know a lot about health literacy. Um, people have been studying the field for um, you know 20 years or so now. And what we know is many people in the US population lack the health literacy skills or supports to do lots of basic things. Um, so in the slides, we talk about understanding health information, 
um, and how it's written because we often write this information at 11th grade reading level or above. Um, it's hard for people to get and keep health insurance and get care. Um, it's a real challenge to calculate dosage and timing throughout the course of a day, getting through the system, making decisions about risks, like whether to get a vaccine, managing their chronic conditions like diabetes, or just, just comprehend what their doctor said. Um, so 93 million Americans have challenges doing this. But, but the reality is um, it's more than 93 million. The reality is this is a challenge for all of us. Um, so on our best day, we look at some of these things and we think, oh, you know, I can do that. That's okay. Um, I have the skills to do this. But on our worst day, when we have a new health diagnosis, um, when we're suddenly told that, that ourselves or our loved ones have a cancer diagnosis, for example, someone's had a heart attack, um, someone needs a serious treatment, um, our skills to make these decisions and process information are, um, you know, really challenged. Um, so we all have this problem. When I think about health literacy, I think about it as a state, not a trait. So it's not who we are, it's not a factor of any specific individual, but at any given time, all of us can have these challenges. So the best thing we can do is provide all of the information in as easy format as possible so everyone can understand. But it's also true that some populations are more affected. So when we think about people who have mental health or cognitive challenges, we know that it may be more difficult to process complex health information. Um, so we need to keep that in mind when we're writing information for that audience. People with lower education um, may have literacy challenges, um, and it may be harder for them to read the information that we often give them in written forms. Um, people with low income often cross with some of these other um, health literacy challenges like low education or even limited English often. Um, so thinking about how these um, cross over to each other and they sort of have intersections that compound vulnerabilities, um, they may challenge folks. Um, people who have limited English may have challenges specifically in the context of American healthcare because almost everything we do is based on English um, information. So if you don't recognize English as the first language, um, you're already in a challenging situation um, if it's not your preferred language, particularly when you're sick. Um, so to the best of our ability, if we can have information translated and have interpreters ready um, to help people process information in their preferred language, um, we can really um, do a better job of providing clear and accessible information to them. Um, we also call attention to the older adult audiences. Um, this is a real challenge for people with health literacy, often because older adults are having more health conditions again. Um, so as you age, you have um, more complex health situations almost always. Um, but it happens at the same time that you're often having challenges with um, your hearing, your vision, other things. And so um, all of this is happening at the same time. And so for older adults, we just need to be really aware that it may not be their reading. It may be their eyesight. Um, they may not be able to hear so clearly, and they may have a novel health condition. So how do we make sure that every time we speak with a person in the older adult category, we're understanding what's the relevant information in a format um, that's meaningful and accessible to them? Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Layla to talk about how we apply these principles to the recover work. Yeah, so what I'm going to show is a quick high-level overview. HLM and Tana Group partner together to produce these materials for recover. So here at a high level is the process that we follow together. And it's a pretty simple process. Um, it comprises four steps. So essentially broken down into planning, then we have writing, we have design, and then we have an iterative re revision process. So the first step here is we really need to understand what it is that we're doing when we're producing material. So this includes understanding the health, the science, the risk information. It's really important that we um, ensure that what we're doing is factually accurate, as Katina mentioned earlier, but also that we understand the problem at hand that we need to solve. The second step is that we apply clear communication best practices. So this goes into the writing of the plain language. Then we go into design and we design engaging print and digital materials. And then the last step is a really critical component, which is where we have an iterative process where we audience test we receive uh, feedback from our stakeholders and we get our materials in front of the communities that we're seeking to serve as much as possible so that we can revise that, those documents. Um, this is not only important in ensuring the materials that we're producing are effective, but also it goes back into the cycle of informing the production of new materials as we go. So as I mentioned, the first part of that process is really planning and understanding. 
And the critical step here is to how to decide best how to support our audience. Um, I often find that this is uh, can be a step that is rushed sometimes or not given enough attention. Um, and it's something that we really work together to try and identify with our clients. So the first aspect of that is really understanding the target audience and what are the specific needs that they have. So whether it's race, ethnicity, whether it's social context, whether it's geography or language, we really need to understand who it is that we um, are targeting. The next thing is to understand the purpose of the material that we need to produce. Um, and so here we really wanna ask the question, why are we producing this material? What is the problem that we're trying to solve? And is this material going to um, accomplish the goals that we have? The next step is that we want to determine whether there's a specific outcome that we're after. So um, Katina referenced this a little bit earlier, but are we encouraging someone to perform an action? Are we trying to change behavior? Um, are we hoping, you know, trying to encourage them to enroll and recover? So those are the questions we're ask, asking here, but also defining the outcomes uh, really gives us something to measure against so that we can see as we put uh, materials out in the field, if we're really accomplishing those outcomes. And then lastly, we look at how is it best to deliver this message to our target, target audience. So one of the things that we want to do is we want to meet our audience where they're at. So are they online? Are they going to prefer something printed that's in hand? Um, is it a billboard for more of a general communication piece? Are we targeting them email? So whatever it is, that's a part of the overall strategy. And asking all of these questions helps inform not only the content strategy, the copywriting, but then ultimately the design of the materials that we're producing. And I'll hand it back to Katina. So we'll talk about how we apply these. So for us, every element of our work includes two fundamental health literacy best practices. So we talked about this a little earlier, but just to be perfectly clear, um, plain language is the foundation of everything we do. And when we talk about plain language, what we mean by that really is um, language that a person can understand the very first time they read or hear it. Um, so you shouldn't have to go back and work really hard to hear something or understand something that's in plain language. Um, but we use this in every material um, and we do full health literacy reviews of the existing materials using the best evidence-based principles that we have. Um, and we do this on new materials as well. So everything we do, we're using plain language principles as a guide. The other one that's really important though is thinking about universal precautions. So for healthcare providers or people who work in healthcare systems, you probably think about universal precautions um, from sort of a, a personal um, biological risk perspective. So we wear gloves every time we touch a patient, we wear masks um, to protect ourselves from, from things in the environment. From a health communications perspective, we want to provide the same um, set of rules. Um, we want to think about, we can't tell by looking um, who may have challenges understanding information. Um, and as I said before, it's a state, not a trait. So at any given time, any of us could have challenges. So the best case scenario is to take a universal precautions approach and just use this with every single person in all of our written and verbal communications, because anybody can misunderstand complex information. And more importantly, we all prefer easy to understand information. So all of us, we can very often um, understand things that are very complex, but if we get the choice, we always want the thing that's easy. And then if we choose to know more, we can always ask for the more complex information and dig in. Um, but, the, but the first step should always be something that's really easy to understand and follow. So these are the primary approaches that, that guide all of our work. Um, and again, when we're thinking about plain language, we're thinking about a range of characteristics like the word choice. Um, so we have choices of words that are multisyllable. Um, sometimes we have a similar word that only has one syllable. So the classic example is often in research and science, people um, use the word utilize. Um, so instead of utilize, you can use use. It's the same word. It means the same thing. There's no good reason to use utilize, for example. Um, so those word choice um, situations are really important. So in every place that we can make a replacement for a simple word, we want to do that. Um, but sometimes there's not a good replacement and somebody needs to understand the more complex word because they're going to hear it again. 
So in that case, we think about providing a definition um, or an explanation for them so that they start to learn the word and they can apply it in future scenarios. So this would be the kinds of words about a treatment or something like that that you would hear again from your own medical provider. We wanna teach those and help people understand for future conversations. Um, we're also thinking in plain language about line length and spacing. So the number of sentences that it takes, or the number of lines it takes to have a sentence, um, if it's over two, it can be hard for people who are lower liter literacy to follow along. So we wanna keep short sentences to the best of our ability. And we wanna use fonts and allow for spacing that give people's eyes a break, um, both between the lines and within the lines. We think about structure and flow um, so that sentences and paragraphs and pages follow logically um, and they build on each other in such a way that people can see um, and, and make sense of the information. Um, I mentioned numeracy before, but every single time we have a number, we need to think about if it's important to actually give people the number, because sometimes we provide them and they don't actually add anything, they just make it harder. But where we do provide numbers, we have to think about how to put that in context where we use natural frequencies and other, other sort of strategies so that people can understand. Um, we know, for example, that when we provide decimals, it's harder for people. Many people have a hard time with percentages and proportions. Um, so how do we provide numbers in the most easy to read and follow um, manner that's possible? And we've talked a lot about behaviors in action, but this is part of plain language as well. Um, so we have two examples of, of, of um, assets that we put together here. One is the glossary of words used in recover. Um, so these are words that we've all worked on together with a large group of people to think about the frequently asked terms. Um, and what's important about this is we've defined them in plain language, um, but they provide an opportunity for everybody to use consistent words um, and terms across our materials which means for people enrolled in the study, um, every single time they see a term, they see it defined in the same way. Um, so it, the consistency really re reduces confusion and makes people feel much more empowered. So here is just an example of sort of the before and after of materials that we received and um, you know how you can clean up and streamline the language to use words that are direct and focused on the outcome or the behavior change that you're after or the action that you're after. So if you look on the left, um, this is an example of a billboard um, that one of the sites had put together and on the right is, is the result of um, our combined uh, efforts around this. So we ask a simple question that gets at the heart of one of the main questions that our initiative is trying to answer, why are some people sick months after having recover? And then a very clear call to action, join the study to help us find answers um, with the additional incentive to get paid for your time. You can see also that the phone number here is um, front and center and very visible um, so that people can call the number and actually execute on that action that you're hoping they'll perform. So we're also providing structure to our content in an easy fo to follow way. Um, so this is an example of a letter um, for antibody test results. And so you see the before version is a fairly standard letter that you would see in a medical study. Um, so we've provided, we've collected blood samples that people sent in. We need to provide um, a, a response back to them and let them know the results. And here, um, the visual here provides really detailed information about the person's results, um, as well as results that aren't theirs. Um, so one of the things that we've done in the after is we've really streamlined to really focus on the specific results that people are gonna see. Um, you see that it's branded to recover, which is important, streamlined content. Um, there are very clear headers to guide people through the process. Um, this is important for everybody, but particularly lower literacy audiences need those visual cues, um, answers to questions that they're looking for to sort of guide them through the text. Um, and then finally, important takeaways are highlighted. Um, so there's a little call out box on the side that said, what are antibodies? Um, so this is an example of how we can provide a definition to a term antibodies um, so that the information pops out and we can teach people the language. Um, the other sort of key piece of information here is what are my child's test results? Um, so it's really showing them the difference between a positive and negative test result here and explaining what that means. Um, so again, just, just visually, they look very different, but from a content perspective, there's some structural decisions and other information that makes it much easier for folks to follow along. Um, I also want to share, this is not from Recover, but it's another material that was created for um, a different a different client, but it's both, uh, it's a piece of material from an informed consent form. Um, so we were able to do a set of focus groups with folks to understand how to update a global consent template. And after talking to about 200 people, 
um, we ended up with this table. And what this table did is it converted all the text from a consent form about what happens in study visits um, to a format that is visual. Um, this was really important to particip participants in the study. Um, they said a couple of things. One is if you give me a table like this, I'm gonna tear it out of the consent form and I'm gonna post it on my fridge and I'm gonna use it to keep up with what's happening. So very specifically, this is a reminder, the heading says what's done at study visits. And then it goes through the screening visit in blue, the treatment periods in green, and the follow-up periods in purple. Um, so they're broken down in those periods so that people can track where they are, how much time is in each part of the process, and then most importantly, what happens at each visit. Um, so the little dots tell you that at the screening visit that's about 12 days before treatment, they're going to get your height, weight, blood test, urine dark, drug screens, alcohol breath test, physician exam, and so on. Um, those indicators for activities people said were really important because it helped them make decisions like, what am I going to wear to the visit that day? Um, am I going to have to get blood taken? Am I going to be there for a long time? Am I going to be cold? Do I need to get someone to drive me? Um, do I need to get child care? There are all kinds of signals here about what people would do in their own life and behavior. Um, and so this table really helped them with that process. Um, the interesting thing, too, that I can't look at this table without sharing is those 200 people that looked at this with us, cared so much about this that they even gave feedback about the colors. So what the difference was between the blue and the green and the purple and how they could visually tell the difference and what jumped out to them and, and the weight of the lines between to help them understand the differences in columns. Um, so, you know, it's really interesting to talk to people and get their feedback about things like this, um, but also to sort of learn from, from what we've done in the past. And so we're hoping to bring some things like this forward um, as we go along. Um, this is also an example um, similarly from another, another project that we've worked on on plain language summaries. Um, it's important to give results back to people and we have to do it in a way that they can understand. Um, so this is an example of a plain language summary. Um, some of the important things is it takes a title from a study um, and it puts it in plain language in a more clear way so that people know what they're looking at. We often provide easy to read summary to glance pages so people don't have to read all of the information to know whether it applies to them and make meaning of the, the most simple data. Um, and then all the way through, we use plain language study approved explanations. So going back to the glossary, thinking about what the plain language terms are that we provide consistently from the beginning to the end of our communications. Everywhere we can, we provide data visualizations. Um, so you see this little table at the bottom. Um, we know that numbers are hard for people. So it may be hard for people to understand in text, 16.5 um, pounds compared to 0.4 pounds. Um, they may not understand that. But for people who even have lower literacy or numeracy skills, they can see the difference between the big blue bar and the little bitty gray bar. And it can make them help um, sort of put this in context and understand the difference. Now I'll pick up again and uh, show you some of the work that we've been doing for Recover and how it all comes together. So similar to the, to the glossary that's established for plain language, which provides an operating framework for all of the writing, we have a graphic style guide as well that's created. So for those of you who might not be familiar with the graphic style guide, it's a document that really incorporates and communicates all of your graphic identity, your brand identity elements. So that comes goes from your logo and how to use it, the scaling, the color background it can be on, to typography, to textiles, colors, graphic treatments, and how uh, the art direction of photography as well. So not only does this help create a consistent visual vocabulary to unify the look and feel, um, you know, that it's, it's not just to make everything look really great, but there, it performs a very specific function too. So a style guide develops visual cues that participants learn and come to expect. So there's a consistency to the materials across materials or visual cues across materials. It also provides a framework to operate efficiency efficiently. So for a large initiative like Recover with lots of people working on different materials, it makes sure that everybody's aligned and everybody's um, speaking the same visual language. Um, and additionally, it provides accessibility standards across the team. So on colors, if you probably can't see there, but on the shades and tints, we indicate the accessibility levels there to ensure that we have the right level of contrast um, and for typography that we establish type styles that are legible and clear to read. So this is what it looks like put together, deployed across various materials, both print and digital. 
So while it establishes the styles, it's then up to us as designers to interpret them for every material. So we have our circle dots, we have our brush stroke highlight, um, and then it also allows us to establish a color logic. So if you look up in the top left there, we chose to use the secondary blue color to identify pediatric materials that are separated from adult materials, which are leveraging uh, the navy blue, which is the core recover color. So it, it also provides a function there in, um, you know, staff being able to visually uh, identify materials and to give, you know, pediatrics its own unique look that is bubblier, friendlier, lighter, and targets and appeals specifically to that audience. So then I just wanted to take you through some of the tactics that we employed in health literacy communications. So this is one of them where we design elements to clearly present information. Um, Katina talked a little earlier about how we look at structure. Um, and, and this is how we look at it and then actually execute on that in design. So if you look at the top, we have a very solid, we have a solid colored header, which communicates the purpose of the document. Um, that's bold, that's where the eye is gonna go first so that the participant uh, gets the context of what this document's all about. We have a muted background that sort of drops away and offsets the primary content, which pops to the front. And then you can see that the questions are set off in these little blocks on the left, which allows your eye to clearly read them and parse the page information. The main content is then set on white for legibility. So these are the types of things that we look at. All documents are different. This one happens to be a study protocol. So then we use visual elements to reinforce key messages. And there's a variety of visual elements that we use. These are instructional in nature. So here the visuals, um, they can either be photographic or you'll see illustrative visuals on the next page, but they really reinforce the instructions. And this allows uh, readers of this document to not only read, but to see what it is that they need to do. So it's a visual accompaniment to each instruction on the left. Um, and so it also adds interest to the page. So it not only performs the function of helping someone understand what to do, but it adds visual interest. So, you know, if it were all text, you can imagine you'd say, oh, you know, 13 steps. But when you have the visuals, it actually engages you to go through each step and identify what needs to be done. Um, they also lighten the page content and, and lessen the visual burden on the eyes. So that's something we spend a lot of time thinking about is how do we ensure that it's not a heavy, dense read? This is probably one of the most important factors to um, communication design and health literacy design in general, and one that is often overlooked. Um, I can't tell you how many clients say to me, uh, there's space on the page, there's open space, let's fill it with more information. Um, open space is your friend. So what we mean by that is the um, blank space and and you know, in this case, the white background and all the space that uh, we give in between blocks of content. So this really offers breathability to the page. It makes it lighter, more readily absorbed. It allows your eyes to sort of pick up each piece of information and digest it um, rather than seeing the page, you know, full of information at once. You're able to parse each bit of information. Um, it also plays an important role in forcing prioritization of content. So for instance, this is an eight page booklet. We're limited to eight pages and we know that we really need um, enough breathability in the design. So it forces you to prioritize what's the most important information to convey within this limited space. Um, it's also a main consideration for making designs accessible as well. And here, you know, uh, Images are worth a thousand words, speak a thousand words. So we use photography to represent our audience. Um, you know, photography really can do the heavy lifting to communicate so much. Um, so photo photography represents the diversity of our audience. Um, it allows you to form a connection with the reader and your audience to help them to relate to what it is that you're doing. Um, similar to the other visuals, it provides interests and breaks up page content. Um, it also plays a really important role in setting tone. So, you know, is this a serious subject? Is it playful? Is it happy? Is it sad? 
Um, all of that can be conveyed through photography that's difficult to convey in other ways. So iconography and infographics um, perform a different function as well. Uh, you know, because they can be uh, scaled down to a smaller size, um, they really provide a very quick read. So if you look here, you can see the heart in the middle of the page. You know that it's a heart without reading the text. You can see the kidney and the brain. So similar to the instructional visuals, they provide a visual reinforcement of the copy, um, but they allow you to absorb content quickly. Um, they reinforce key concepts. So over on the right, we can draw your eyes attention to 39 million, which is then reinforced in the copy below. And then the infographic of, of illustrating the three in 10 people who get COVID will have long COVID. You can clearly understand that concept by seeing the three out of 10 figures on the page. And then we have a multimedia design strategy. So again, in meeting our audience where they're at, we wanna make sure that we have all these various touch points. With Recover, we have um, over 50% of our audience that reaches our website does so through a mobile device. So it's really important that we're optimized across all of these devices so that our audience um, can access the information that we're putting out there and engage with us in different ways that they're most comfortable. And then another important consideration with our audience is ensuring that we're speaking their language. So materials are then translated into multiple languages. Um, and then that allows us to reach, you know, more specific communities and to cater specifically to their needs. And then I talked about accessibility it's really woven throughout. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, this is sort of the, um, you know, the hidden aspect of accessibility that is sort of the last part that we do, but we really want to make sure that we're including, um, you know, our friends who may be vision or hearing impaired. So Recover follows 508 compliance standards. And this means that any electronic material that we put out there has embedded into either the code or into the documents, alt text and tags, and is optimized so that screen readers can read those documents so that uh, this audience uh, feels as much included as, as any of our other audiences we're reaching. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Katina and Layla, for that, that uh, great presentation and giving us a flavor of what you guys are working on for Recover. Um, so now we're gonna move to a question and answer session. And um, please uh, feel free to enter in your questions in the chat or raise your hand and uh, you can uh, speak your question. And um, we already have one question from the audience. Um, can the presenters please talk about specific challenges in using plain language to reach people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and extreme low literacy? That's a really good question, and it's um, a real challenge. So thinking about um, the more extreme issues of literacy, um, the more we try to rely on um, formats and modalities other than text. Um, so written text is hard. The, the less strong your reading skills, the harder it is to rely on text. And so we think about how do we use visuals, graphics, drawings, very simple line drawings, um, information to help people um, connect with, with the information in, in ways other than the words. Um, I think video often works really well here because you can read and listen. And from a sort of neurobiology perspective, um, you know, when you're seeing video and hearing people speak at the same time, it highlights um, or it lights up two different parts of your brain and it makes it easier to sort of connect and understand and remember. Um, so I think that's a really good reason to use video in certain situations. Um, for us, though, in health literacy and plain language, we're always thinking about who's the audience and what's the purpose. And so in the case of creating materials for the audiences that you recommended, we really have to think about the, the modality of the information. And it's probably not a brochure or flyer or something that's written. Layla, do you have anything to add? No, I, I would agree with all of that. We've had um, experiences where we've uh, essentially developed the equivalent of what of like a graphic novel. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, having something, um, you know, which is which is sort of a, a media that that 
everyone's familiar with, um, you know, and, and that can skew in either direction, depending on the demographic or the age of that reader, either to um, for children um, and make it more comic like comic book like um, all the way up to adults. And please um, enter in any questions that you have. I can I can ask a, another question to the, to the two of you. Can you talk a little bit more about your approach as you're de um, beginning to develop a new material and how your two groups really work together um, to create something? A part of the process that I walk through is um, we go through four steps. We have the planning, we have the copy um, and the writing of the plain language and design. Um, you know, but it's it's a much more fluid and collaborative process. So really at the beginning with the planning, that's when our two teams come together and it's critical that, um, you know, we, we hash out the details together. We understand exactly what it is that we're producing, who we're producing it for, why we're producing it. Um, and at that time, we really strategize the materials um, and have a discussion around content strategy. So content strategy is important because depending on the material that we choose, whether it's a printed booklet or a flyer, um, you know, informs the how much we can say, what we're going to say. So we decide on that together and then um, our teams split up and go separately and do the writing and do the design. And then we bring it back together again because having really effective health literacy communications is really a marriage between your copy, your content strategy, and your design. So they, they have to work in concert together. So we come back together as a team, we review everything, we make adjustments as needed, and we look at it holistically then and see is, is this from our planning session meeting the objectives and what we set out to do. Um, and then we pass it off for, for comments. Do you have anything to add, Kajina? Well, the one thing I would add is, um, you know, I think that all of this is really strengthened by the fact that we like each other and really respect each other's work. Um, and so this works really well when you have a healthy respect for um, sort of what you're doing as a content creator and what your partner is doing. Um, and so I think that, you know, for us, we didn't know each other before we started to do this work. Um, but with the team at Recover, we really worked hard to sort of identify what all of our strengths were and we laid out processes that work for us. And so every single time we follow those processes um, and it really works beautifully. Um, I had an, uh, um, another question um, uh, and I'm sure other folks in the audience are curious too, but I was wondering if you could give us a little peek into the future um, in terms of the next steps that you guys are, um, other materials or things that you're working on that you're excited about related to plain language and design. Um, what's what's um, coming down the pike? Um, so for us at HLM, we're starting to think a lot about the summaries of the research results. Um, so mission critical to get the data back out to people. Um, and this is always a conversation in science. How do we report back to communities? And across the board, we don't do it well in science. Um, we we um, collect the data. We put it into journal articles. We use it for the next grant and we move on. Um, efforts like this really are an opportunity to change um, that whole system and, and, and to sort of um, fully embrace the idea of um, connecting back to the communities and the people who have participated and given so much of their time and energy to this work. And so um, we're working really hard on that. All of the various um, advisory boards really are engaged and interested in that idea. And so I think I think it's going to set a new standard for reporting back and engaging with communities as results come out. And we're very excited about that. Um, Layla? Yeah, and so we've really been, um, you know, up, up to this point, focused on the early stages of the participant journey and with recruitment materials and um, getting people on board with the Recover program. And, you know, one of the exciting parts from this point on is actually uh, delivering materials that, um, you know, they engage with throughout their participation in the study and then getting into retention materials too. How do we keep them excited? How do we keep them feeling that what they're doing is worthwhile, um, that it's a meaningful effort? Um, and, you know, those are exciting challenges, but also break us into um, looking at different media that we can use. Um, we've talked about um, maybe doing a very public facing summary video that's very accessible that sort of rounds up all of the study research and all of the results um, and deploying that. Um, 
you know, looking at how we can take uh, materials that we've de developed and breaking them apart to uh, distribute them in different channels. So, you know, what are we going to put out there in social media that sort of um, caters to that particular audience? You know, are there quicker, shorter videos that we're going to do? Um, so there's there's a lot yet to do and a lot of a lot of really interesting um, materials that we'll be producing both print and digitally. Um, and then exploring various channels to communicate through. Wonderful, really exciting um, what's coming in the future. Um, I know we're running out of time, so I'm gonna turn this back over to Janelle um, to wrap us up. Thank you again, Katina and Layla for your presentation. Thank you, Shauna. Thank you to the presenters. We appreciate uh, you guys coming out today and sharing this, this great uh, information with our network. Um, Shauna, we also want to thank you for moderating and asking questions. Uh, we we want to make sure you guys have this information. You know, if you would like to reach out to uh, Recover with any question questions, please reach out to the Recover CSC mailbox. Um, if you have any other questions, uh, comments for uh, Layla or Katina, we have their information here on the slide. Um, so please take the time to write this down. We can also put it in the chat for you guys so you can have that information. Uh, so we really hope you guys appreciated this uh, learning hub. We do want you guys to keep an eye out for the next one that we're having. Uh, it, will be, it will be hosted in July 21st at 6 p.m. So sometime, uh, but we wanted to give you a heads up from uh, about it. And this will be um, about building diversity and inclusive, inclusivity through engagement. Uh, and this will be uh, presented by Al Richmond, and who is the um, executive director of CCPH, and Melvin Jackson, who um, is also a consultant for the CCPH. So um, this information will also be in your inbox um, in the future. Um, and then we also want you guys to um, have the opportunity to give us feedback about this learning hub. Um, so please tell us what you thought and um, you know, fill out the survey. We'll also be sending this via email if you don't get the chance to um, fill it out here. Thank you. So thank you guys, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much.